Well, this weekend there'll be plenty of men playing at the Detroit area Scottish Highland Games. And we've invited a gentleman down here at Tool Time to tell us all about it. With court charges that won't cost a king's ransom. Which should help you manage your personal affairs more easily. What more could you wish for? This happy ending is brought to you by Vodafone Personal World. Call now 0645 500 100 with your credit card handy and get this digital phone for only £59.99. I was told that I was playing Cinderella, all right? A male prison. A female governor. The press will love her. Now she's on trial. So you're the new governor then? Answer the question. You better tell her before she finds out. I don't think I can finish what I started. Nobody goes into that bloody wing until I say so. From Linda LaPlante. Don't you think it's until I say so? The Governor, coming soon on Yorkshire. Now on Yorkshire, it's time for the world news from ITN. News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald. Executives pay the price for the shambles at bearings. High level struggles to beat the treetop protesters. Is the partying over for the military's top brass? And goals galore mean a championship fight to the finish. Good evening. The first big clear-out of Bearings Bank executives began today, nine weeks on from the Far East fiasco involving Nick Leeson. The bank announced 21 resignations from posts in London, Tokyo and Singapore. Its new owners, ING, decided not to wait for a Bank of England report into the affair after all. Today, Nick Leeson's father said the Singapore authorities, who are trying to extradite his son, want to make an example of him. Our business correspondent, Mark Webster, reports. Such is the scale of the clear-out at Bearings, city experts say it proves the bank's failure of financial controls was widespread. But those who left today are still under contract and restricted in what they can say. Well, I think it's a sad day for um, the 21 people, who have, um, many of whom have put in many years of, uh, of service for the Bearing Group and, um, and uh, for me as well. Executives of ING, the Dutch company which fought the bank, wanted to wait until the Bank of England had produced its report on the crisis, but the pressure for action grew too great. The system must have been fundamentally flawed if it allowed one individual trader to be able to run up such huge risk positions without detection. Yet until today, the only Baring's employees who'd resigned were the chairman, Peter Baring, and his deputy, Andrew Tucky. Now they've been joined by Peter Norris, the chief executive of Baring's Investment Bank, and virtually all the other executives linked with Nick Leeson, including Ron Baker, the head of financial products, and James Bax, the head of the Singapore office. And although Baring's new owners said in a statement that what happened in Singapore was exceptional and didn't show a fundamental flaw in the bank's systems, many other senior officers have also left the bank today. The investigation into the crisis that nearly broke Britain's oldest merchant bank is certainly going much wider than one single maverick dealer, Nick Leeson. Mr. Leeson himself's now spent two months in a Frankfurt jail. Tomorrow, the Singapore authorities will press for his extradition on fraud charges, a process he'll fight to the end. His widowed father, Harry, told Carlton TV's London Tonight he remains bewildered by what's happened to the eldest of his four children. I mean, we're devastated, of course. I mean, you know, it's just unbelievable, to be quite honest. Can you get your own mind around the sort of sums of money involved in what's supposed to have happened? <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's, I mean, you're talking about nearly a billion pounds, aren't you? I mean, we don't, we don't deal in that kind of money, do we? When he visited him recently in prison, he said his son dreaded the prospect of extradition to Singapore. Terrified. Wow. Well, well the, it's not very nice in the Singapore prison, by all accounts. As Bearings works to repair its reputation, Nick Leeson believes when his version of events is made public, there could be more bloodshed on the 14th floor. Mark Webster, News at 10, Bearings Bank.
Another drain on police resources was highlighted today. Some forces are already stretched by animal rights protesters. Now the National Audit Office says the policing of controversial road building projects is costing half a million pounds a month. Police began breaking up one such demonstration against the M65 extension near Blackburn. ITN's Ben McCarthy watched him try. After weeks of living in the trees of Stanworth Woods, the protesters were today picked from the branches one by one. It's a long and dangerous process. The campaigners have roped walkways between the trees, so specialist climbers have been hired to help with the eviction. Despite a huge police presence, the job of clearing the site has been left to contractors. But protesters have complained bitterly about their methods. Those climbers are endangering people's lives and the sheriff is not doing anything about it. He's just letting them get on with it. The sheriff says it's the protesters who've been putting up a fight. There has been a, a considerable amount of uh, uh, violence towards my uh, bailiffs and tree climbers. Uh, they have uh, found that their hands have been stamped on, their heads have been kicked and so on and so forth. So it's all been fairly rough stuff. <laughs> Progress has been slow. This afternoon, the first of the trees were cut down and the bulldozers moved in to begin clearing part of the site. But the bailiffs still have a lot of work to do. There are about 30 tree houses in this wood, but only four of them were cleared today. So it's bound to be a long and costly operation before this site is cleared for the new M65. Private security on motorways is an expensive business. The bill for the Blackburn bypass and four other schemes has already reached £24 million and is going up by 575000 a month. Stanworth Wood is the latest in a series of anti-road protests which started with Twyford Down three years ago. To the government, they're costly and disruptive, but the protesters won't go away. They're still in Stanworth Woods tonight and the fight against the M65 will continue tomorrow. Ben McCarthy, News at 10, Lancashire. Battle was joined at Westminster today at the start of a critical week in the run-up to council elections in England and Wales. The three main parties were all in campaigning mood, and the Labour leader Tony Blair suggested his campaigning to reform his own party isn't over yet. Here's our political editor, Michael Brunson. Three days to local elections in England and Wales, and the prospect of grief for the Tories is producing an increasingly frantic hothouse atmosphere in and around Westminster. Out campaigning today after his victory on Saturday, Tony Blair had already signalled his dismay at the way some unions had opposed the clause for change, but the focus would now switch to the reform of policy. No old dogma, no tired thinking, no soft options will be allowed to stand in the way of this policy agenda. But amid talk of the unions being put in their place, John Prescott said, we have to move together. Those in victory should remember that. Some quickly called that a warning shot, others a split. Mr Prescott said that was absurd. Bill Morris of the TNG wouldn't talk about it at all, but the man who's challenging him for his job said that in future, the membership's views had to be better represented. Frankly, both democracy and the credibility of our union and the credibility of our relationship with the Labour Party demanded that we should have had a ballot. Uh, we now need to look to the future and ensure that what happened on Saturday never happens again. Meanwhile, Most Gordon Brown began, as Tony Blair had promised, to, to flesh out to economic policy. Market competition alone wasn't enough. Consumers needed better protection. A Labour government will legislate to stand up for the consumer. It means we will first of all provide proper protection to those who purchase mortgages on a similar basis afforded as it afforded to investors by the Financial Services Act. But that and similar promises over pensions and insurance did not impress Michael Heseltine. Well, it's the speech he didn't make that interests me, in which he really talks about what Labour's policy is all about. And we know what it is. It's giving power back to the unions. It is about taxing Britain's leading managers. Uh, it is about a social environment which puts great costs on the British industry. And it is about a minimum wage which destroys jobs. That's what he doesn't talk about, but that's at the heart of the deal they've done with the trade unions. The Liberal Democrats say that Labour is pinching their ideas. If Labour is telling the country that what Britain needs is Liberal Democrat policies, our contention is that what it needs is Liberal Democrats to introduce them because we've thought them through. Labour may pinch them here and there, but fundamentally a lot of what they say shows they don't understand how to make the market work. As to the unions and Labour and the bloc vote, 
Those close to Mr Blair are pointing out tonight that the NEC is required anyway to consider change as the mass membership grows. In addition, Mr Prescott also said today that he thought that change to the system would now come before rather than after the election. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. One of the United Nations most successful ceasefires in Bosnia ended today with new outbreaks of fighting and there was nothing the UN could do about it. They failed to renegotiate a new truce. In Croatia, which borders Bosnia, Croatian forces launched an all-out attack on a Serbian-held area. Our correspondent Paul Davies has covered the Bosnian war since it began three years ago. The all-too-familiar sight of refugees trying to escape from the latest outbreak of fighting and bloodshed in former Yugoslavia. This time, it's Serbian civilians, mostly farmers and their families, forced to leave their homes when the Croatian army launched an offensive against rebel Serb positions in the disputed Krajina area of Croatia. Croatian Air Force MiG jets like these filmed perfecting their marksmanship, attacking uninhabited Dalmatian islands, have been seen by UN observers today rocketing rebel Serb positions. The Krajina Serbs have fought back but have lost much territory. They're now regrouping, calling on other Serbian forces to help them and have taken 120 UN personnel hostage. We could be in the point of a restart of the Croat-Serb war and if that is then taken in relation to Bosnia you could find the whole region aflame. Renewed fighting in Croatia has overshadowed the ending of the much abused ceasefire in Bosnia, but a return to all-out war seems more likely tonight as UN Special Envoy Yasushi Akashi has failed to persuade either the Bosnian Serbs or the Bosnian government to extend the agreement. For so long, the underdogs, the Muslim-led Bosnian government and its allies, have used the ceasefire to re-equip their army. Both sides now seem to want to fight. The UN forces looking increasingly vulnerable. Of course, if the job of the UN forces becomes impossible because of the fighting, they will have to withdraw. So far, all UN diplomacy has won is verbal promises from both sides that their armies will show maximum restraint, words that carry little weight when so many written agreements have been broken. A report into hospitality in the upper echelons of the armed forces had a great deal to say today about big official residences enjoyed by some members of the top brass. It said they did offer a relatively cheap way of entertaining, but said there should be fewer such houses and domestic staff should be sat. Here's our defence correspondent, Geoffrey Archer. It was the saga of Air Chief Marshal Sir Sandy Wilson's soft furnishings that put the lifestyle of top servicemen under public scrutiny. In an ill-judged third of a million pound refurbishment of his official residence, it was revealed that 33,000 pounds had been spent on curtains. One justification put forward for spending large sums on both the style and the staffing of such homes was that they are used for official entertaining. A report today, however, proposes tighter control on such expenditure. The report calls for new rules to cut the number of official homes now at 75. A cut in the 350 full-time domestic staff, including 110 cooks and chefs. And greater accountability to limit the four and a half million pounds spent on entertainment allowances. The Armed Forces Minister accepted the report, but defended entertainment budgets. We're pleased with this, and we think it's a step forward, although I I'm, want to be a great pain that no one should believe that any of this money is lavished. It's very, very well spent indeed. Entertaining in military homes like this one in Gibraltar is cheaper than using places like hotels, the report maintains. But Labour said the cutbacks weren't deep enough. All it does is introduce some small modifications. But I'm sure those in our armed forces who are on the front line will be disappointed at this report. And it really is time that the senior military elite began to tighten their belts like everybody else. Defence manufacturers will be relieved at the report's backing for continued entertainment spending. They believe it can help them clinch deals with foreign buyers. Still to come on News of 10 tonight, 50 years on, Russia reveals another horror of its wartime past. Why United believe they can still do it. And bank holiday or not, how some celebrated May Day the traditional way. We've been revelling all night and drinking all night and we're here in order to celebrate the coming of summer.
Squeeze two limes and pour the juice into a bowl. Now take a teaspoon of ground coriander, a teaspoon of whole cumin, a touch of turmeric, and add the spices to the juice. Don't forget a pinch of salt. Add some chopped mint and blend together. Meanwhile, cut four Sainsbury's chicken breasts into strips. Add to the marinade, making sure all the chicken is coated. Cover with cling film and chill for at least 30 minutes. In another bowl, mix one tub of Sainsbury's natural Greek yogurt with some humerus. Humus. Cover while you cook the chicken in a little Sainsbury's olive oil for about eight minutes. Finally, take some toasted pita breads, cut in half and fill with the chicken. Serve with a Greek salad and a generous spoonful of the yogurt and humerus. Hummus, mummy. <laughs> Sainsbury's, everyone's favorite ingredient. Some people like to eat it because it's kind of Swiss. Others eat it every day and never. Some love it in the morning, but you don't have to eat it then. And some because it's original album. Some people like to eat it when they're run late. And on Sunday morning, it tastes great. Some eat it meditating with their early mornings then. And some because it's original album. Join the motoring organization that offers a free mobile phone so you can get expert help without delay. Green Flag National Breakdown, raising the standard of our vehicle rescue. Staggering. An absolute marvel. Just to be here and to see this, it's hard to describe the feeling. I've seen some things, but this, well this is pretty awesome, I can tell you. It's just breathtaking. I feel like jumping in. In fact, I think I will. And the view's not bad either. During a kick around, you can work up a real appetite. Good shot. So we usually end up in the clubhouse and grill some burgers. Quorn burgers. Quorn burgers are a tasty alternative to meat and very healthy. They're low in fat and a good source of protein. And just like other burgers, you can eat them any way you want to. Quorn, a happy partnership of taste and health. New stamps from Royal Mail celebrate peace and freedom. They also celebrate the dedicated service of the British Red Cross and the unceasing work of the United Nations in the quest for peace and freedom worldwide. The stamps are at post offices from Tuesday, and you can also buy them in this special presentation pack. Peace and Freedom Stamps, from Royal Mail. Welcome back. Don't look now, but did your diary or calendar say today was a bank holiday? In Scotland, the banks were closed, but in England and Wales, there's no holiday, of course, until next Monday. It was moved to coincide with VE Day. The confusion was raised in the Commons. One Labour MP said the government should stop mucking about with May Day. Howell Jones has our story. These postmen were among the few Scots told to work today, but they abandoned the postroom for the picket line, angry that they weren't enjoying a May Day holiday with the rest of Scotland. I think it's absolutely disgraceful. Um, this is a traditional Scottish bank holiday, it has been for as long as I can remember. Uh, it just seems now that the post office counters and the Royal Mail can change holidays whenever they feel like it. But the rest of Britain has been suffering its own degree of May Day madness. Many calendars and diaries marked today as a bank holiday, when in fact next Monday is a day off marking VE Day celebrations. I think there's been quite a lot of confusion. Uh, we, in our federation, uh, we made it quite clear that we we're going to have the 8th off. But other ones weren't clear. And uh, they thought there were the two holidays. Employees thought there were two holidays. And I gather even worse has been the post office. Working people need May Day. Labour Day went marching on in London today, holiday or no holiday. It's just one day. Throughout Europe, they have May Day. Throughout the world, they have May Day. In Oxford this morning, the May Day march was not towards socialism, but away from the bars. Cheers! <laughs> We've been revelling all night oh, and drinking all night, and we're here in order to celebrate the coming of summer. Spring in the air then, but some took it too literally. 
a leap off the Magdalen Bridge as traditional as nuts in May. He may be out of the running, but he might still influence the result. The leader of the French National Front, Jean-Marie Le Pen, refused today to endorse either the two candidates left in the race. He said Conservative Jacques Chirac and Socialist Lionel Jospin had both betrayed France and represented a detestable choice. Our diplomatic editor James Mates reports from the campaign trail. Today, thousands marched for Jean-Marie Le Pen. Just eight days ago, millions had voted for him. Four and a half million voting for a man who despises the European Union and demands the forced repatriation of colored immigrants. One in six French voters. But how will they vote in the second round? Le Pen is no friend of the socialist, but so extreme are his views that he can't bring himself to support the right-wing candidate, Jacques Chirac, either. I cannot and I do not wish to recommend that you vote for either of the remaining candidates, he said. His message was a plague on both candidates, but his rhetoric was aimed principally against Jacques Chirac. And it's Chirac who is relying on getting most of his votes next weekend. So much so that Chirac has been moving himself to the right. But as his supporters point out, the right and the extreme right are not natural allies. Mr. Le Pen hates our guts. And he's right to hate our guts because we hate him too. Because he's everything, he exemplifies everything we fight against. That feeling appears to be mutual, which is why many Le Pen supporters plan to abstain, even if that means a socialist victory. I would vote for neither of them. Jospin or Chirac? Abstention. Jamais, Chirac. Jamais, Jospin. Jamais, jamais, jamais. Vive le temps! Vive le temps! But how many of Le Pen's four and a half million will follow his advice? On that could depend the outcome of Sunday's election. James Mates, News at 10, Paris. The Channel Tunnel has been hit by another problem. Eurotunnel admitted that a door fell off one of its car trains in the tunnel last Friday. The door was hit by another train and disruptive service for three and a half hours. Campaigners trying to, flee, to free paratrooper Lee Clegg have reconstructed the shooting for which he was jailed for life. They want to prove that he couldn't have fired the bullet which killed a joyrider at a Belfast checkpoint. And the latest figures show another half a million listeners have switched off Radio 1. The station hopes the latest presenter, Chris Evans, can boost its ratings. Fifty years after the end of the Second World War in Europe, there's still no forgiving or forgetting in some parts of Russia. When the battlefield guns eventually fell silent, all sides promised to bury each other's war dead. But the Russians never fully kept their side of the bargain. In some areas, they still refused to do so, and we have exclusive pictures to prove it. Our Moscow correspondent, Julian Manningham, sent this special report. Adolf Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union decided the fate of World War II. The biggest battles of the whole war were fought on the Eastern Front. By the end, the Nazi armies were smashed and at least five million German soldiers had died on Russian soil. A few of Germany's dead are buried at a cemetery on the outskirts of Moscow. Most of these men were prisoners of war who died from ill-treatment after the bitter conflict. Today, German money ensures that their graves are properly kept. It is to this small cemetery that Germany's Chancellor Helmut Kohl will come as part of next week's ceremonies commemorating the end of World War II in Europe. But what he will not be seeing is what is happening to the remains of thousands of other German soldiers who perished on the great battlefields of Russia. At Stalingrad, now renamed Volgograd, an imposing memorial records the names of the hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers who died in the war's most decisive battle. But the defeated Nazis have found no dignity in death. A local warehouse stores the remains of some 10,000 German soldiers, each packed in a numbered plastic bag supplied by the German government. Under an agreement between Russia and Germany reached in 1992, each side is supposed to look after the war dead on each other's soil. Here, the Russians have dug up thousands of makeshift German wartime graves, but plans to rebury the remains in a special cemetery have run into fierce opposition, as a Russian official involved in the project acknowledges. Some war veterans believe that if we do this, the memory of fascism and the victims of fascism will be forgotten. They think it's unpatriotic. A site for the new German cemetery has been chosen near the village of Rosochki. 
but memories of the war still run deep here in a countryside that was devastated in the fighting. Half a century ago, Russian villagers showed their hatred for the Germans when they finally surrendered. And today, the people of Rosochki cannot accept the idea of a German cemetery on their doorstep. For me and my family and everyone here, the Germans brought only misery. No one invited them to come here. What do you mean, bury them here? You mean bury them next to where our soldiers died? Shame on you. The villagers have even threatened to burn a planned German chapel if it's ever built. At Stalingrad and other battlefields, many of the places where the Germans buried their dead during the fighting are being systematically looted by grave robbers. The thieves are after medals and weapons to turn into cash. In today's Russia, there is still no room for sentiment about the enemy dead of World War II. Julian Mannion, News at 10, Moscow. Here, Manchester United threw the race for the Premiership wide open tonight with a 3-2 victory at Coventry. They now cut Blackburn's lead at the top to just five points with a game in hand. United's hero was Andy Cole, who put the current champions 2-1 up 10 minutes into the second half.